feel like I should be telling jokes or something. Uh, I think we've gone uh, live on YouTube right now, so I guess I'll get started. Um, hello and welcome to our PSU Studio MFA Artist Lecture Series that is sponsored by the School of Art and Design here at PSU. This series brings together artists, curators, and critics from a variety of disciplines to explore the subject of their work before a live audience. All our lectures for this spring term are held remotely due to the current coronavirus pandemic. And you can view the schedule of our upcoming artist talks on our Instagram page at PSU Studio MFA. At the end of this lecture, we'll be having a Q&A by our MFA students and a few faculty members. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Mac McFarland for our second remote lecture this term. Mac is an artist and cultural producer. He has worked as curator for Pacific Northwest College of Art since 2006. Currently, he is the director of the Center of Contemporary Arts and Culture at PNCA. His exhibitions at PNCA have included commissioned projects of new works from technical media practitioners, Critical Art Ensemble, Eva and Franco Matis, and Disorientalism. He has also curated a review of Luck Timon's printed works a group exhibit marking the centennial of John Cage's birth and a comprehensive look at the process of the comic journalist, Joe Sacco. McFarlane's curatorial method utilizes his artistic practice while collaborating with artists uh, in the production of new works and exhibitions, particularly in the form of exchange exhibitions with another city, such as costumes, reverence, and forms with Philadelphia's Vox Populi, binary lore with Chicago's Three Walls, and fast forward with Frankfurt's Stadel School. McFarland's explorations and research manifest in the form of exhibitions, events, postcards, performances, and videos. With his works and exhibitions, he aims to develop a space for the viewer to experience an intersection of visceral aesthetic and cognition via contemplative sensory experiments. We were actually fortunate to have Mac conduct individual studio visits with our cohort last fall, and we are pleased to have him talk to us today and share his works and insights. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Raja. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it, um, I mean, the format of like me talking and then the conversation, <clears throat> um, specifically, I guess, with the Latour text that I do want to make sure we have time to get into a little bit. And though I want to make sure that there's time to hear uh, your questions or your areas of interest. So I'm going to try to keep my part uh, maybe down to like 20 minutes and then shift in the last 10 minutes for the Latour conversation, which can maybe carry through to your interests um, in the, the Q&A portion. Um, I also just want to say that I mean, I, I have prepared something to talk about like things that I've been up to in the last like 30 days, say, um, just because I don't think it's a moment to not think about the current moment. <laughs> um, however, I know that you've all been sort of maybe looking at things that I've done in the past. So if there's something that you're interested to hear about more of, uh, then please let me know. Or if there's like other kinds of like biographical questions, um, please also let me know. Um, so if, actually, and if, if there is anything right now that you're like, oh, could you make sure to talk about X? Maybe say it now, and that way I could try to work it in. So that's that moment where I was saying, you might have to unmute now, but you might not need to. Uh, and if not, then I'm going to go ahead and I will just share screen and kind of get into uh, what I've been up to. Hey, Mac. Yes. Um, maybe just, um, I, I guess one thing that might be really good is just kind of like giving us a brief background in terms of like how you got started with curation or like um, being part of the art scene and um, doing, I, I, I guess I'm just kind of like really interested in that as like uh, starting, a starting point. Totally. Great. Fantastic. I will start with that then. Um, and I will start with that maybe uh, through 
Uh, there we go. Maybe I'll start with this then. Um, so yes, now I'm sharing screen and now maybe as part of this thing of uh, background, I will attempt to um, Google a little bit. So I was born in Pennsylvania in um, a small town called Avella. Uh, and it's like a tiny little town in Pennsylvania where um, you had the first day of deer season off of school. Um, so like really rural, mostly farmers, uh, kind of out in the boonies. Oddly enough, this place had a decent little art program uh, or department, I should say, um, where there was these studio classes where you could just kind of do what you wanted to do. And the art teacher who was uh, also the football coach and a Vietnam vet who was colorblind, who made these really neat paintings, watercolors, um, would just sort of help facilitate the things that you wanted to do. So uh, this being the late 80s and early 90s, I was pretty interested in like airbrushing because of the mall. And he brought in somebody to like show me airbrushing and I learned how to like airbrush uh, uh, billiard balls. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of like, and I participated in a lot of like school plays, a little bit as an actor, but more as lighting person. And then I joined the US Navy after that. Um, worked on F-14s, like the Jets and Top Gun, and um, started volunteering at a theater company in Virginia Beach during that time, and really like started working in theater. Uh, when I got out of the Navy, I continued to work for that theater as stage manager and assistant to the artistic director. This was all in Virginia Beach. Um, and then I decided I should probably go to college, and I moved to uh, San Francisco, um, and there I really started doing a lot of photography. I studied filmmaking and I spent a lot of time at this place, Artist Television Access. Um, and if you don't know ATA, it's a, uh, micro cinema and so much more. Uh, they have a window display where artists produce, uh, installations once a month. It's pretty fantastic space. Um, and it was actually during this time where I met uh, a longtime friend and collaborator who's actually now here in Portland named Carl Deal. Uh, we worked at the same photo lab together in San Francisco. Carl had just uh, finished his undergrad at Syracuse University and moved out to San Francisco in part because of ATA and uh, the kind of mad scientist filmmaker named Craig Baldwin who lives in the basement of the space. Um, uh, taught at SFAI. And Carl and I, Carl was really fantastic because Carl really has like come out of, uh, you know, like growing up in Syracuse, there was like a real serious punk scene and this sort of organizing thing that I like didn't really have as much drive towards or leaning towards. Um, but working with Carl really kind of got me that bug. And so I really just started organizing a lot more things. I did a little bit in Virginia Beach when I was working at the theater, but really in San Francisco it started. And then when I moved to Portland in 2003, um, just kind of continued. Like one of the first things I did when I got up to Portland was organize a fringe festival uh, next to the TBA festival, because at that time I thought TBA was too expensive and I couldn't go to everything because I couldn't volunteer enough to go to everything. Uh, these, you know, it's funny how these things shift in your brain as uh, time progresses. Um, but yeah, so that was sort of the start of all of that. And during all of that time of um, working to organize film screenings or other types of projects, I did a lot of my own work, a lot of uh, making videos and performances um, and postcards, which is maybe what I'm going to uh, shift to here right now and great recorded so just gonna start with this um, 
this is not full screen. How do I do that? Um, so I just want to start really quickly with uh, a little self-promotion because I think uh, we're usually pretty bad at that. So I thought it would be good to start with that. Um, there we go. Um, so myself and Carl Deal and Leo Goldsmith, Nat Hawks, um, the Nigan and Big World, who are two brothers living in Tallahassee right now, are going to be doing the Holding Happy Hour. If you all don't know about Holding Contemporary, it's a space here in town um, with a really interesting uh, shareholder model, which we can get into later. Uh, possibly if you're interested, let me know. But yeah, we're going to be doing a kind of live video experiment uh, with a group of musicians and taking over the the um, screen with um, our video happenings. Should be a lot of fun, 5 p.m. Uh, next Thursday. So come on by. Um, so I think I, I just really wanted to sort of start with things that I've been doing in the last 30 days uh, as a sort of practice. Um, for many, many years now, I've made postcards as part of a practice. So this is a four by six inch uh, object on a piece of wood. Um, and actually these are, uh, things I'd had actually had kicking around the studio. I hadn't been able to resolve them for a while. Uh, these particular ones, um, and, and like right after we sort of went into lockdown, I was like, oh, cause they have these holes in them. If you can see there, um, and these were always, this series was always a series of paintings I would make on these little four by six pieces of wood. And they're all actually titled to look through to income inequality. Um, but the, these ones I couldn't quite resolve the paintings on. And then I was finally like, fuck it, these paintings are done. Um, and I actually just titled them to look through to someone six feet or two meters away from you for obvious reasons. And it was sort of like the first kind of gesture just to make myself do something in this moment. Um, because I think like many people, like things have felt really heavy. Uh, and I also just want to say that I'm probably not as uh, productive as this talk might make me seem. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that because there's just a lot of time of taking naps too. Um, and so these, th these paintings, like I said, come out of this series, which uh, I really started because I love painting. Um, I'm like, totally and have always been pretty obsessed with painting even though I haven't done much of it or studied much of it but since like really I mean what really kind of got me into art actually was when I was uh, in boot camp in Chicago the first leave I got I, I ended up going to the Chicago Art Institute and I'm not even sure why I went there but I did and there was a de Kooning show up and I remember just being pretty blown away blown away by those works um, and kind of starting to understand like what art was in some ways. And in part because there was also the erase de Kooning um, by Rauschenberg where he erases uh, or maybe supposedly probably really happened, but who knows uh, this de Kooning thing. And so it was fascinating to me as somebody who's one of their first experiences in contemporary art was de Kooning and then the absence of de Kooning or this erasure of de Kooning uh, could be put next to that work in the same light. And it was just really fascinating to me. So I think that's like my, maybe my obsession with painting. Um, but I also have like a chip on my shoulder around abstraction, even though I love abstraction. Um, I, I, I do have a thing about like, I don't know, maybe abstraction versus um, like straightforwardness or like abstraction versus uh, like ambiguous. Um, like sometimes I want things to be pretty straightforward even in their abstractness. Um, and so I think like making these paintings, these like abstract works, some of them done over long periods of time, some of them done very quickly, um, and then titling them to look at uh, through, to look through to income inequality is also about the market of uh, painting and abstract painting in particular. Um, when I was talking about postcards, um, it seems a little out of order, but I'll just jump in. So uh, I have this like long practice of this postcard work and some of it kind of manifested in this, this stuff, which was like making postcards with a 10 foot pole. 
and they really come out of this drawing of George W. Bush and Kerry, John Kerry, during the 2004 election. This is probably 2003 I made these. Uh, most of these things that I'm showing you are uh, four by six inches. These are an exception. These are uh, 20 by 24 inches. Um, and they're charcoal on paper. And I literally just put a piece of charcoal on a painter's extension pole and made these drawings. And then I would switch out with a rag to get those smudges and then go back in um, with the uh, charcoal again. And then I, so I did these and I'm like, oh, that was fun and interesting. And I, I had some kind of compelling notion uh, there, but it was also a little too easy. So I shrunk down the thing and did them on four by six inch pieces of paper. Um, and so then I started writing things and drawing things. So this is I rock. Obviously, some of them are less obvious. This is a, these are drawings of uh, Paulson, who was George W. Bush's um, treasury secretary. And these are more Paulsons. And then, and these are just on like a little thin card stock. This is, this is Colin Powell, who was uh, a general during the first Iraq war that was like very much in the media a lot and then became secretary of state. And he famously went to the UN and um, you know, presented all of this pretty weak evidence for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, and it, so, yeah, these, so I, I also want to say, like, if you don't know this expression, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Um, and so that's part of uh, the kind of maybe joke uh, here. But then also just, then this is when I actually just finished a series during this time. Uh, this reads, lifetime appointments for US Supreme Court justices. Uh, and so I started this series uh, right after Trump was able to uh, nominate someone, which was a fairly scary moment. Um, so yeah, like these, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, and then I mail these to uh, like a group of people, like all my postcards, a group of people who I either respect, have worked with in the past, um, or have a relationship. So like one of these, uh, the lifetime of Sup for Supreme Court judges went to uh, Oregon's two senators. And then I also just sent one to, uh, they're like the Supreme Court has an address. So I send it there. And on the backside, I always say uh, what it is written with a 10 foot pole or drawn with a 10 foot pole and my return address. Uh, this is just to sort of like show some of the other drawing practice I've had in the past, which comes back. Uh, this is a drawing of uh, Sam Adams um, made when he was a city council member. This was Tom Potter, who was mayor at that time. Um, these are on uh, news, newspaper from the Oregonian. Um, this is Hamid Karzai, who was the first prime minister of Afghanistan after the US invasion. I did a whole series of world leaders on these Fry Electronics ads. I was pretty interested in like who would become obsolete first, like some of these world leaders or this like 1.7 megapixel Olympus digital camera. Uh, and also when I make these drawings of people, uh, I have this process of listening to either like their Wikipedia page being read to me or uh, maybe an interview that they've been doing. But I try to mix in this sort of learning about them and making their image. Um, these are just some more postcards. I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. Um, these, again, are each individually four by six inches. These are all drawings or paintings of the moon. Um, I had a studio for a while that had this great window with a really nice view of the moon. I don't even remember which direction it faced, but I, through that period of time, uh, I just made a lot of drawings and paintings of the moon. Um, mostly just because at this point I was really starting to work as a curator at PNCA full time. Um, and like there was a shift in my, my time there where it was like, oh, I'm not just here part time or I'm not just here for a little bit. I'm like really enjoying this work curating and I am really um, kind of thriving in it. And so it was, it was hard to maintain a practice, but I tried to do that through creating um, these sort of painted postcards. Uh, and, a, and a lot of the situation with these, it's kind of just messing with materials um, 
on a larger sheet of paper and then ripping them down to four by six inches and then going back and uh, placing a moon um, where it seemed to make sense. Sometimes there were no moon uh, when I went to draw it. And so I would actually just try to do these, um, these sort of images of what the clouds look like. And there was this like red sign that cast this weird light. So um, these are created in 2011 during the Occupy. Um, these works are uh, called Fill in the Placard. Um, and again, we're really uh, a material based experiments first with a lot of spray paint. And this is really when I first started using food coloring which uh, is a really great material that mixes really fantastically with a lot of other um, spray paints and inks and acrylics. Um, and then I kind of went in and did this wash over top of it afterwards and got these really fun um, looks. Actually, the backs of these are pretty amazing and I can talk about those a little bit more later. Um, Sticking with postcards because it really is like one of my main outputs. Um, these every every year at New Year's, I make a New Year's Day postcard and I send that out to a, a huge mailing list. So I tend to make them digitally because um, I send about maybe 200. Um, this was like 2015. This is when I first got an iPad and was playing around with these um, um, these like sketch. Uh, programs on the iPad. This one is, um, I think, 2016. Um, and then this one is seven, I think, no, yeah, 17. And I, that year I did four different ones. Uh, in part, I, I actually made that duck drawing for my dad's birthday. And I just was like, wow, that's not a bad duck. Um, so I just decided to incorporate it. And then sometimes um, I would do these ones, which are uh, oil paint. Um, and just, I just, I made 200 of these like really gestural things. And then I said, I said like have a gestural 2017 or something. Um, and then that, this was this year's um, kind of a different tone. Uh, this year, I had this, the back of this red, it could be a big tent kind of year or a general strike kind of year. Uh, this, that thought in the, our current situation with coronavirus is interesting about big tents. We would not want to be in a big tent together. Um, but maybe we are actually on a general strike being kind of forced by this coronavirus. And maybe, um, I mean, some of that we could even get into with the Latour text a little bit. And then these are some things I'm working uh, that I've, again, done since we've been in the lockdown. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of mail, not just because I send mail, but um, because of my job. So this is actually a, a postcard from Gagosian Gallery who sends some of the nicest mail or had um, for years. Like the budget for this mail must have been incredible because it's like on super beautiful paper. And this is a, an advertisement for a, uh, oh God, I can't remember his last name now, George, German painter who did the things upside down. He's a misogynist. He said horrible things about women painters. Um, maybe that's why I've blocked that out of his head, Baltes. Um, so yeah, so it just really like, I've, I've been collecting these things to do something with, and I was like, oh, well, here's a good moment to maybe do something with them. And again, these are things that I've created uh, recently. Um, again, that same sort of process of working a background and then coming back to it. Um, and really then just trying to resolve how to get this message on there. Um, and to make it kind of stand out and readable. So really just trying to deal with that um, kind of color situation. And again, these are uh, spray paint, uh, different types of ink, printmaking ink even, um, and then food coloring and in India inks. And oh yeah, and so some of these backgrounds I'd made, I saved uh, to try to make some drawings on. Um, this is Jeff Parker, who's a guitarist, uh, who I'm actually listening to right now, um, listening to a lot of Jeff Parker. So I decided to make some drawings of Jeff Parker. I think also in part because I, um, I watched that film Cave of Forgotten Dreams, uh, by Werner Herzog. I'd never seen it before. And I was really fascinated by the way that those artists had like made these drawings with the contours of the cave. 
And so then I started thinking about like, oh, well, how can I like fit these, this like, I really want to make this like portrait drawing, um, but how do I fit it onto these like weird backgrounds that I hadn't really um, been ready, hadn't really been prepared for that type of thing for. So, um, and then I am going to switch out really quick before, um, you guys have been posting a lot of the video stuff, so I feel like I might not get into that. I'm um, gonna switch though to a curatorial project that I've um, really started re-engaging with um, right now because um, hmm, that didn't seem to work. Okay. So is that what you're saying? I guess this is what you're saying. Um, so this, uh, this project is uh, loosely titled Arrowhead and it takes place at PNCA. Um, so I think everybody's been to PNCA. When you walk into the building, it looks like this. Uh, and where those, where I have those magenta rectangles, um, this is what's up there. Uh, which are these chief heads, these like chieftain figures and this feathered headdress, these are carved into the marble of the building. Um, you know, like this building is built in 1918. And so these things have this very strange settler colonial uh, use. Uh, these are not portraits. These are the same identical head again and again. And so it really falls into that area of uh, red face and this sort of like ownership uh, of bodies and especially uh, non-white bodies. Um, so I, I first noticed these, I think on a tour of the college before we moved in there, uh, the tour of the building before we moved in there. And then always assumed somebody would do something with these. Um, like a student would make something about it, but it never really happened. And then uh, I was working on an exhibition uh, called The Earth Will Not Abide with uh, a group, it was a group exhibition and Sarah Seastrom, who's a local artist here in town, uh, she's part of the Hennes Coos tribe, uh, was a part of that exhibition. I brought her in uh, to be a part of this exhibition that originated in Chicago to have a kind of local connection to these issues. It was a exhibition really about um, kind of extractive land use. Uh, and Sarah wanted to do this project in this main hallway where she displays this cash material. These are, these are uh, materials that she will then use into weavings uh, such as this, which was part of the exhibition. These are uh, a child's hat for, uh, it's a woven basket hat for children um, made of these types of material like bear grass and sedge and tool. And so she does these public displays of this material in part to uh, sort of remind people of the sovereign rights of the indigenous community, but also literally she just needs a place to dry these things. Uh, so this was part of the exhibition and she was like, I would love to do it this in the hallway. And I'm like, oh my God, that seems beautiful and incredible. Uh, have you ever noticed these things uh, in the hallway? She's like, oh no, I'd never have. We started dialoguing about it. And, you know, it's really like, I think like a gesture, something to deal with these, uh, to at least like make reference to them with this work in the hallway would be nice. So she ended up doing this installation uh, where she put this caution tape around them. She put this red tape over their face to call them out as red face. And then she actually tied it to a, a more contemporary experience that she had. She went to a, a trailer resort out on the coast. Um, uh, somebody had said it. She actually went out there for uh, an Anagama kiln firing that she was invited to. They set her up to stay at this trailer resort. The trailer resort ended up put, uh, putting her in the arrowhead trailer that was decorated in Indian kitsch. And so she, this was pretty troubling. And so she created this really interesting um, or maybe uh, biting uh, photo read and um, deconstruction of all this Indian kitchen and reading everything in that trailer through that lens and then creating these prints, which we then hung up above uh, the top areas above the chieftain heads, which is like this big eagle and a cornucopia. And so this stayed up 
uh, during the run of the exhibition and we have left the, um, the caution tape up and the red tape over the chieftain heads. And what we've done is, this is another view, this is the front door. So there are eight of these things. There's four in the front and then four in the back of the building. Um, so what we've done is, is we applied for a grant in which we received from uh, the Oregon Community Foundation, the Creative Heights grants. So we have now um, $100,000 from them and then another $20,000 from the Ford Family Foundation to commission a series of uh, indigenous artists to cover these. We would really love to like in, enter a dialogue about removing them um, in part. Uh, that's the th also thinking about the red tape that's over their faces. Um, the removal, of course, is a different process. PNCA also went through a, a leadership change. And so those things are a little more slower, but we are moving forward with this covering. Um, so just to give you an idea, this is the work of um, Greg Archaleta from the Grand Ronde Nation. Um, this is just a mock-up of what something could look like. He's one of the eight artists, Sarah Seastrom's another. This is uh, Greg Robinson from the Chinook Nation. Um, he's another one of artists. And then I can show you actually, this is Toma Villa. This is actually the piece he's created for it. Um, since this, he's really been working a lot on this project. This isn't done, um, but the, the carving is done and now the kind of finished work is happening on it. Um, and so these will all be installed out here. Um, the other artists, so there's Sarah Seastrom, and then there's also Natalie Kirk from Warm Springs, Lillian Pitt from Warm Springs, and then um, Sherrod Yonker uh, from the Hannes Kuss tribe as well, and uh, also uh, Anthony Hudson, um, uh, also known as Carla Rossi from the Grand Ron. Um, so I think I'm going to uh, stop my screen share um, because that was a little bit and, oh, so you couldn't see what I was sharing. You just click it away, okay. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. And maybe now it would be great if everybody could come back and maybe we could talk about that Latour text just for a few minutes uh, or, we can pause actually first, and maybe there might be questions about anything I just shared, um, and then we can go from there. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. That was that was a lot of great material. Thanks for sharing all of that with us. Um, uh, I don't know if you, they if uh, Ralph, do you still want me to um, manage the Q and A at this point? Um, um, I think maybe we can just like ask some of the questions that we talked about that seems relevant to um, Max presentation. And I guess for me, like maybe just to get, get us started with questions, um, do you show like Mac, you showed like different types of material and I loved hearing about your background. I feel like it kind of gives us a really broad scope of like the reason as to like how you ended up where you are at now. Um, and so I, I guess I'm just kind of wondering, it's like, I, I feel like the two main components of what I would consider as your practice feels very much like somewhat of um, like maybe a studio based or like somewhat a materially based practice. And then another one is more of like a curatorial kind of practice. And I'm kind of wondering how you see those two things influencing one another. And I'm also wondering if you see them as being apart from one another. Yeah, um, I think because I, I never had formal training as a curator for such a long period of time, it was just something um, I did uh, that when I first started working as the, like, the curator, um, I really made a, a, a choice to like kind of keep these things separated, like my practice as an artist and my work as a curator. Um, and so you will often see that I don't like the things that I make are very different from the things that I tend to curate. Um, and, and two, I think part of that is, um, you know, Arnold Kemp said this really interesting thing to me early on when he arrived at PNCA, he's like, you know, you've really gone to a different place with your curating when you start curating outside of your own taste. Um, and that was very interesting to me and really actually quite an influential comment. 
um, for me. And so I, I, there's these like funny overlaps that happen where I use for the longest time, as I was saying, like this idea of creating these postcards, this correspondence was like a way of having a practice. And it was also a way to engage artists I was working with in my practice um, because I would send them these postcards, especially the New Year's ones. And then if people responded back, it would send them different things, um, which is always awesome. Um, maybe, yeah, like now we can open it up for questions. Uh, I was going to ask you since the, the start of this uh, sort of like stay at home order, have you been involved in any curating projects? You kind of mentioned a lot of the postcards you've been making. So I was wondering if uh, you've also been working on, on curating a project at this point. Yeah, I think right now it's, I've been thinking about various types of exhibitions or artists I'd want to work with in the future. Um, people who, whose response to this I would find interesting or also thinking a lot about the ways in which this is going to shift that practice. Um, it's been really nice actually. The, I did a program with Independent Curators International in 2010, this sort of curatorial intensives that they were organizing and Kate Fowle was uh, leading that organization back then and began these. And um, they reached out and sort of were like, hey, it's been 10 years since you've done that. And it's a crazy time. Like maybe you guys wanna get together. And so we, we have, we've gotten together a couple of times now and it's been really fascinating to talk with a group of people who are, um, there's, I think when we get together, there are seven different countries people are in seven different countries. And so it's been really amazing to hear like what the situations are like, but then also what um, people's responses, these curators responses are in this time. Um, you know, things have been shifted for the college in terms of the schedule, but um, which has actually created some like an opportunity. Uh, there's a curator and art historian in town named Laura McLaughlin uh, who had proposed an exhibition a while back and it was like, this seems really amazing, uh, networks of belonging, um, really thinking about uh, what it means to have networks within the cultural sphere. And there were, there were artists in there who I knew and groups I knew, and so I was very excited about this. And I was like, but I don't know if we'll be able to like, generally the exhibitions are programmed out two to three years in advance. Um, and so I'm like, I'm not really sure when we have a slot try to work it out maybe here I don't know but then things shift and I was like hey Laurel let's let's try to do this and so like there was actually a grant that fit in and we really have worked that out and so like that hopefully will be our first exhibition after all this comes to a close in October and and I think part of the the practice of there's the, the practice as a curator, which is like creating your own exhibitions. And then there's the practice of a director where you're like kind of running the whole thing. And a lot of that then is like, like working with other people to help their visions, like help make those visions. But then I also think of it in this sort of like long arc because I know that like students who are freshmen this year will experience this exhibition. And then I think about what their exhibition experience will be like over two or four years and who's being served as well. Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> so you're not really transitioning to uh, having exhibitions online right now. You're sort of thinking after this is over, having a physical uh, exhibition, correct? So we actually just launched um, our sort of online exhibition gallery space this week at PNCA. Um, and so the current exhibition that Lucy Cotter curated that opened up on March uh, 5th, which was so great we could have that open, is uh, still in the space currently. Um, and so we have that up as, as like a way to start that process. And then we're gonna start doing the uh, student exhibitions, the BFA and MFA student exhibitions, which would have been thesis, 
we're hoping to do like a physical thesis exhibition in the summer um, is our hope. Uh, hopefully before the fall semester kicks off. Um, I right now I'm not thinking about creating like online exhibitions in part just because the moment is such that for the college, I want our focus and our focus should be on the students. And we create exhibitions for the students and curriculum. Uh, and right now, like there's not a lot of brain space for that. Um, people are trying to get done, people, like especially the students who are graduating and some of you are in this situation. And it, I don't, it's not, it's not the time to, for the college to be like, oh, and hey, check this thing out. Um, it's really a time for us to like, make sure everybody's doing okay and to get everybody through this. And, and so I, I'm thinking about those physical exhibitions then in the future. And this project that I just showed, but which we're loosely calling Arrowhead with these chief heads really trying to keep in touch with people on that right now. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, both Alex and Aaron also had a question. Go ahead, Alex, if you want. You. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, one of the things that I, I really enjoy about your curating is um, your ability to kind of utilize the platforms and the voice you're given, but then still also be critical of those environments. Um, and I'm kind of curious how you navigate that kind of criticality, um, but then also still like maintaining those platforms and kind of making use of that. Um, like, I think it's really great what you do at PNCA to give other people a voice that might have not had it there. Yeah. Um, I think I've been there a while and I think longevity helps in being able to be critical from a place of respect and even love. Um, so I think that's really helpful. Um, you know, Sarah Santilli's, uh, who taught at PNCA for a while and who's this really interesting author, she's got this book called Draw Your Weapons, um, which you all might find interesting, um, said this great thing. She's like, I love teaching at PNCA because uh, there's never like certain things just aren't questioned. Like if I bring up the patriarchy, nobody in a faculty meeting, she's like, if I bring up the patriarchy in a faculty meeting, nobody is saying, oh, is there really a patriarchy? Like, it's just like, yes, of course there is. And I feel like PNCA being an art school and being the scale that it is, uh, you have that kind of understanding and uh, political will even. Um, to be able to, to get into things. Um, and then I think, you know, I, I do believe the old expression that you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Uh, Aaron, go ahead. I think Aaron had a question. Um, so I, I uh, we've shared some of your videos that you've been sharing on Instagram. And um, I was just wondering if you could speak more to those and, and like how you feel about using um, like that social media platform as a way to, um, to share, to share these ideas and to share things and like what, what sort of feedback you may have gotten from that? Yeah. Um, yeah, those videos are all from a series of works I started in, uh, 2005, um, called Kinetto Casts. And I really started those with the advent of the video iPod. Um, I was really struck when the director of IT at PNCA mentioned he had watched uh, Goodfellows in his bed on his video iPod. Um, and I was just like really blown away as like somebody who'd studied cinema. Um, it was really kind of like taken aback by this uh, moment, right? I mean, this is also, uh, YouTube is just really starting um, in this moment. And so it really shifted my perception of the way moving images operated um, and really started thinking about this sort of like single viewership, uh, which then kind of fomented into, you know, a kind of Fluxus Yoko Ono style 
of uh, making where you have these like suggested titles to try to like have this physicality with the work uh, where the art isn't so separated from life, but is really about creating a moment where the art and the life can be uh, maybe joined at the hip. Um, and so like when being in this sort of like lockdown, I was like, oh, I haven't made a, I, I actually haven't made a video, like just a, an edited video in so long that the platforms or the softwares I used to use, I don't even, I don't, we don't use anymore. Like Final Cut Pro was sort of my last one I used a lot. I'm like, I don't even really know how to use Premiere. So I was like, oh, I'll mess around and try to make something really. Um, and then as far, as far as like sharing things on social media, you know, I don't even, I have very little criticality in some ways when it comes to that. Uh, in part because it's such a huge component of the contemporary art world that it just seems like if you want to share a thing using social media is one of the lowest hanging fruits. And I actually think sometimes that's not a terrible thing. Um, you know, and you, I sent that bio and I, that bio was actually specifically written for a grant around exchange exhibitions, um, which is why it kind of highlights those, but that is an area that I am deeply interested in. And one of the things that's so um, key to making exchange exhibitions works is artists and curators and other cultural producers having an online presence to share. There are actually artists in Portland who I've been like, I have like cobbled together images to include them in the sort of like packets of like, here's a hundred Northwest artists that you should consider for this exchange exhibition. And this guy doesn't have a, have a website. So like I've cobbled this together for him. Um, so like, I don't know, like for me, like that experience, having that experience sort of in a repeated forms, um, both not just in my city, but hearing other curators say that as well, has really shaped, I think, shaped how I think about sharing work online. Do you guys have concerns about sharing work online? Oh, I, I think, think we, we, sorry, I was just gonna say, we were talking oh, about I, what platforms would be available to us, you know, uh, to do that. And so I was gonna ask if you had any advice or suggestions on how to you know best represent ourselves, but just also what generally speaking, what other platforms are there other than maybe Instagram? Um, I mean, I guess if you're, I think it really depends on what you're hoping to accomplish or like what group of people you're trying to reach um, and then what kind of work you make as well. I mean, I think like digital works, especially like in a, if you're making, um, videos and things like Vimeo is a pretty great platform um, and has a fair amount of users and it has a good um, sensibility. But just having a very simple website is, I don't know, I think just really, really an important part of the moment and for not only for you to share your work, but for other people to share your work. Thank you. Alex, did you want to ask a question? And then also Darby had a question too. Oh yeah, I was, I do, I do have a question. I was just going to comment too on the, on the um, utilizing Instagram or social media for art. I, I've always just viewed it as a, as a good source of free promotion. Um, it's sometimes a little like weird to push yourself, but it's also free in a way to get people to see it. Um, so I think the reservations kind of pay off for just visibility. Um, what I was going to ask and in, in to go to the, the Bruno Latour reading, um, in terms of, I guess, the your curating practice, your art practice, or just kind of what uh, is going on with art in general, um, yeah, what would you like to see continue or change or kind of rebuilt after kind of things resume? Yeah. It's pretty, I mean, I don't like in terms of 
I'm trying to think of like what's stopped in contemporary art practice that I would want to see continue to be stopped. And I'm not sure I can I quickly say that. Um, I think in terms of what should change or and maybe like what's been also more prevalent is that cultural producers should be paid for their labors um, and not just artists, but like independent curators, um, preparators, you know? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think like that, the aspect of people making a living um, from this work, you know, it's been, it's, all, I, it's been that meme of don't think art's essential, try to get through, you know, the quarantine without Netflix and your books and your music uh, and your paintings has been uh, fun to see. Um, so I think that that would be the thing I would want to see change and maybe, maybe a little less um, of the, the kind of hunt for the, the obscure artist and the, the kind of trophy uh, aspect of that with curators. If that makes sense, that was not a great sentence. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, trying to find the next hot take kind of deal. Cool, thank you. Um, can we have Darby's question and then move, can we all move on to the Bruno Latour reading discussion? We can go ahead and move on. Mine was um, pertaining to artists' rights and Instagram and um, and we kind of discussed that a little bit, but um, I've, I think there was recently a lawsuit or at least it seemed like there was a lawsuit where an artist lost to Instagram um, in a court battle over the use of their image. And, um, and so I was wondering your concerns about like, or thoughts about, um, a separate sort of practice for Instagram versus like posting actual works. I mean, particularly as a photographer, that's like a concern of mine is posting my actual like work photographs on versus just a separate um, environment that I'm cultivating through Instagram. Yeah, it's, I mean, those aspects of the internet in general are so hairy. Um, and I, I just don't even have the experience to really fully answer that question. Um, I think a, a resource locally um, is Cole Haver, who's a copyright attorney. He was actually part of the, um, he was part of the legal team with Negative Land, who is a Bay Area based, uh, group like musical group who had an album called U2 the letter U and the number two which was actually their cover looked just like an actual U2 album um, and of course U2 sued them and then there was this huge lawsuit um, and Cole was a really amazing he gives actually a lot of free workshops around uh, copyright issues for artists um, and is always on the side of the artists and I know PNCA has um materials that he's donated about this issue in our library. Um, so I, I would, I would point in that direction because I am at a loss to be honest. Cool. Thank you for answering questions, Nick. Yeah. Um, how do you want to get started with discussing? Yeah. The Should we just look at um, this little splash page um, introduction thing really quick. Uh, I just like, for me, this, this little paragraph here, let us take advantage um, of the forced suspension of most activities to take stock of those we would like to see discontinued and those on the contrary that we would like to see developed. I suggest that readers try to answer this short questionnaire for themselves. It will be specifically useful as it will be based on personal experience um, that has been directly lived. This exercise is not a question of expressing an opinion, but of describing your situation and maybe investigating. 
it is only later if one were to give oneself the means of contemplating the answers of many respondents and then composing the landscape created by their intersections that one could find a form of political expression. But this time embodied and situ situated in a concrete world. So yeah, I just thought I'd kind of start with that. And then really just those questions um, and just thinking about, you know, what, I, I mean, I guess we could, we could jump around the questions or we could focus on just one of them. Um, I've been pretty interested in this first one, just like what are the activities that are not happening that we would not want to see resume? Um, and we were talking about this even a little bit before everybody jumped in. Um, and for me, like I'm, I'm particularly interested in that one, but there might be others that, um, that are, are most relevant. I mean, I guess in the other one, it would be like, what are the activities um, that we want to make sure start again? <laughs> right. Um, maybe this, like, yeah, like, thank you for recommending the, this exercise to us. Um, it's really exciting to be able to do it with you. I guess for me on my end, like, I'm, I'm interested in what students have to um, say to these questions. Um, and particularly in terms of like education, like thinking about ways that um, art education kind of shifts and um, moves along with the times, um, given that we're in a critical time, like what does that mean? Um, I'm also just really interested in um, the ways that uh, young people think about political organizing, um, given that uh, they're like, I mean, at the moment it's like we're working with a different kind of like social, different types of social networks, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe this is a good time to unmute for everybody just so we can have a conversation and maybe we'll move to gallery view. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I, I guess the, the thing I've been that I would like to see continue is I've definitely seen an uptick of people purchasing art. Um, like a lot of like people selling stuff on Instagram and people buying it to support artists. Um, and I think that being in the quarantine has definitely changed the way people are spending money. Um, Cause you can't go to restaurants, you can't go to bars, you can't just like go window shopping or whatever. And so I think that that's, um, showing people a different way to spend money and then that you can purchase these artworks and support people. Um, but what I hope doesn't change is that like, I know it's like a, a dire time people trying to be supporting, but I also hope people continue it because it's not like things were particularly great for people trying to make a living selling art before this. Um, and so I hope that that's at least something that sticks with people as a way that money can be saved and way it can be spent and help support uh, different communities. Yeah. Uh, um, one of the things that I hope continues is kind of how we look at accessibility, um, especially within the education system. Um, I know that it's been a lot of work for instructors to kind of completely shift their syllabuses or syllabi in order to be online teachable. So like, how can we keep that accessibility moving forward? and kind of like different ways of, of teaching methods. Yeah, I think that's been a pretty interesting one to, like it definitely, the, the process of doing this has really shown that it isn't that hard to create accessible online spaces um, and having that and translate to maybe these mixed spaces where there are people IRL um, and then people not. I think, I, I certainly hope and I, that there are groups of people within education environments and in the business world who are thinking like, how do we 
how do we then make this translation? Like what, what's going to be needed to do that? I think that there's been a really interesting refocusing on local community um, insofar as trying to support local local businesses and um, and investing in in the community and I hope that that holds on um, I think you know we with such facility can travel all over the globe you know with flights and everything and um, while that has you know brought a lot of benefits I mean as this has slowed down so dramatically like it definitely has an impact on the environment right and so um, thinking about cultivating from an arts perspective cultivating the local art um, um, culture and landscape and building that community and growing that community um, I think um, is hopefully something that will um, prosper like during this time and continue um, after the fact since this ease of you know traveling and going to different places um, is more challenged. Yeah, I, I agree with that a lot. I, I feel like it's it, it seems to me like it's important to keep the focus like on community now since it's like it I, I feel like for myself like I've never wished that I knew my neighbors better <laughs> so that it's like I could at least like feel like I you know like knew the people on my street and um, and that's something I'd really like to see like building up a lot more is like supporting and like Alex was saying too supporting our local artists and our community of um, of people feels like it's um, yeah <laughs> it's where we should be putting our uh, focus. And then I guess I'm wondering like what after we are starting to hang out in person again, um, like, like what are the, I feel like most things are give and take. Um, like it's hard to do everything. And so to like sustain the, the local focus, um, like what's, what, what are the the methods or the the means um and then maybe also the measures uh like what does support the local right no that's a really interesting question because i think the mechanism in which we understand what's going on in the world right now is through the news right and it's like in, in many ways like um the more globalized the news becomes in the case of the pandemic like it feels like it, it, it's like an accurate account and like whatever happens in the local kind of follows suit, um, which is like really interesting to think about in terms of like, okay, like how do we prioritize connecting to our communities? Um, it does feel like at the moment that feels like a paradoxical question <laughs> because everyone's trying to avoid you every time you see them on the street. <laughs> Um, but I do feel like there are things that are happening around my neighborhood that have been really interesting. I know that Jenny Vu has been like post putting up posters. Um, and I know that there's artists that are like delivering masks to people. Um, there's people that are just kind of like doing some like cleanup on the streets. Um, basically anything that would make people feel less restless. I see children biking on the streets again which mm -hmm. has been really interesting. Um, I feel like those are conducive to that. And, you know, it's nice to like even see these things maybe in a not so intentional level, but that they're just organically forming as, as, a, uh, as a result of people being able to focus on home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I feel like that, the, the kind of focus on home has been a huge way to, to deal with what's going on and definitely chatting to my neighbors a whole lot more. Um, and I mean, I've started creating like a weird little uh, village on part of my lawn as well with some little ceramic houses and random uh one minute sculpture kind of things 
just because there's so many more people walking around. I think, I think I'm like one of the things I'm always interested in is like this kind of double take or like things that are out of sync. Um, so like providing that for people who are walking by uh, just seems a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I really love that too, um, especially going for walks and seeing seeing those sorts of things and people putting stuff up in their windows. And I, um, I was working at a coffee shop in Northwest um, when all this hit. And so when we had to close, we put up signs like trying to like cheer up the neighborhood, even though we were closed. And um, yeah, I like that idea of, of like making the focus on like, what's the community you're walking around in and what are you looking at? Um, and it's it's been fun to, e to even just like, even spring here in Portland, seeing people just stopping to smell the flowers in people's yards right now um, has just been really nice to see. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess for me, the question doesn't become what the transition to this looks like, or like what are the mechanisms in which we can, um, that can be conducive towards this particular kind of transition. Because I feel like um, just seeing ki kids uh, biking down on the street, it feels like a very natural thing that we, you know, we want to sort of like be able to um, have activities and, and be able to do them freely um, in our neighborhoods. Um, but I guess it, like for um, at least the way that I'm thinking about it, it seems much more important to think about like, how do we uh, prevent ourselves from getting distracted if that's like a natural predisposition, right? Like what are the things that are distracting us? And are those things to be avoided, which I guess kind of gets us into a conversation of like, what would we rather not have exist anymore? <laughs> right. um, because that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, Yeah, I agree with that. I was, uh, I too was noticing a lot of uh, kids playing around too, around where I live. And it's interesting now that it's almost like people have, especially kids, more free time. You know, before there's more structure, you know, there's uh, school, then there's after school activities. And it feels like, you know, you go from one thing to the other. Uh, and I'm thinking also when I was younger, at some point I had more free time and then quickly you get to high school and it becomes one structure after the other and one program after the other, all these requirements that keep you just from going on, you know, simply taking time to figure out what you want and uh, going on a bike ride or so. Um, so I don't know, I don't wanna say no structures because I don't think that's the right thing to, to go to do, but um, just maybe a change of how that structure is, is um, operating. So it maybe gives more freedom in some way or another for people yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it it makes me think about like oh what do we prioritize in terms of like ways in which we protect our loved ones and our families because i think that there's something about like i i think that there's like this looming suspicion that there's like a predator that's just like out in the corner that's about to like get your kids you know but i feel like that's been checked out of the window for the sake of like at least getting like some time outside for your kids <laughs> during times of isolation. And it really does put things into a, a very interesting perspective, the things that we do prioritize given any specific moment. Mm -hmm. I, I think a thing for me in like figuring out those priorities too is kind of like, like before going on like Instagram or being on my phone was kind of like, you're busy, you're going through the day. So then you're just like on your phone, you're doing it passively and you're not really considering the time that you're spending on it or those things. And then now that like you're free, I mean, like you have things still going on, but like you can be on your phone like all day. And then like, I know when this first started, it was something like I would like sit on my computer and just like surf the web for like hours. Cause I could, and I don't, it was, and then you're kind of figure out like, oh, that wasn't like, I, that actually wasn't enjoyable. And like kind of figuring out what things you can do and then being like, oh, that was like a ton of time. And that actually wasn't an enjoyable thing. And then kind of uh, like, it's like your mom tells you to not eat cookies for breakfast, but like, I always thought I wanted to. And then you eat cookies for breakfast and you have a stomach ache and you're like, oh, okay, that does suck. 
(laughs) (laughs) and so i think some of it too is just like having being out like figuring those things out has been i don't know odd or thing for me and then figuring out what things are actually yeah like organically enjoyable and like make improve my day and those things yeah that that slowing down has has seemed to be like pretty beneficial to a lot of people and i a, a friend of mine who works with um kids with learning disabilities has been like doing online meetings and she said for some of those kids they've they've actually improved significantly having their parents home with them there's no like rush to get off to school and they're having having more one-on-one time and it it's like really helping out a lot (laughs) in some of those instances which is nice to see um how has the experience been for your kids darby yeah, I was just going to say, um, she said to I feel there's a couple of things that I feel like um, have made a significant difference. Sorry, they're in the background. I hope it's not um, too noisy. Um, but the early morning rush to school and then just generally like the commute. I mean, for me personally, like um, gaining the time of commuting, driving to school, dropping off, picking up like finding parking, et cetera. I feel like I've been like gifted an extra three, four hours a day. Um, And then with the programming, um, we very intentionally under program our kids. Like we, they are involved in a max of two activities at any given time. And while a couple of those have continued, you know, via Zoom, um, we're able to go through their the educational portion of their homeschooling, like the the hardcore subjects in the in the morning, um, in a relatively efficient way, and they so they have so much more free time, right? And um, they've been like on their own, completely independent, like making board games. My daughter's making like art installations for the Easter Bunny, and like all these things like this time has given them this space of creativity and that like beautiful childhood freedom of just manifesting their imagination um, has been really lovely. Hmm. Right. Yeah, it's nice to have time to be bored, Um, but also to just kind of like feel your body and like acknowledge how you're feeling. Because sometimes it's like you're going, 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 and then you, you, by the time that you get home, like you're pretty much wrecked, too wrecked to examine, like what it is that you're feeling, right? And it, um, it's given me a lot of time to think about, like, oh, like how does that, how does that specific kind of experience fuel the world kind of crumbling, in a way. Um, and like, does like if this experience equates to like feeling lighter does that make the world lighter? And it, like, I guess like I'm having a lot of questions around the micro um, ramifications of this current moment and the macro. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that that thing of having time to examine uh, has been pretty fantastic and like sobering. And uh, hard. Yeah, yeah, quite. Um, cause there are things like, I do miss like overloading myself with seeing things and doing like things. Um, it was like, we, uh, we were in a meeting at PNCA a couple weeks ago and, uh, V Maldonado was sort of speaking about like the way some of the people are handling this and he, and, uh, V was saying that. The, the hardcore introverts are really thriving right now. And I really love that um, perspective, you know, that like people who are, who, who really operate so much better by figuring out their own interactions and deciding how those interactions would ha- happen are having such, a, having such a moment where I think the extreme extroverts where I might place myself are, you know, I'm like going to like three different grocery stores in a week, just small ones, just so I can like talk to a stranger. Yeah, I had um, I had a colleague once uh, tell me recently that um, she drove by IKEA, <laughs> like 
exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just to see what's going on over there. <laughs> Any sense of life. <laughs> um, I guess I'd love to hear more around like, because I feel like that, like the, the first question is like really crucial in terms of like the Latour reading. It's mm -hmm. like, because I, I feel like it ties to so many things, like to think about what we're willing to ditch also implies um, what we're willing to give up. Because I think that like, I, I think a lot of like that, like our social toxic behaviors and maybe like I'm making patterns where patterns don't exist, but it's like, there's so much of it that's also tied to our privileges. And we were talking about this last week, like for example, driving a car. Like that's a privilege, right? Um, but is that needed? And like, what does that mean in terms of um, if we were to implement that socially, if it, it, if there was a way to implement something like that, then what does that look like in terms of the things that it affects? Like how does going to the grocery store affected by that? How is going to work affected by that? Um, like, or any kind of social relation for that matter. Maybe that's too big. <laughs> uh, I was I actually thinking uh, about modes of transportation and how, um, you know, a lot of right now, not a lot of people are flying. And then I was thinking how uh, a lot of the time I would find myself basically forced to take a plane because there's no other mode of transportation, you either have to drive or you take uh, or you fly to go even like within a state or neighboring states. And I was thinking of uh, high speed rail that exists in other countries in Europe and you know, Asia, and how it's not really taken advantage of here in the US as much. And so I was thinking within a state and between neighboring states, it would make sense, better sense anyways, ecologically to have you know, light rail versus flying everywhere when you can, you know, go, you know, pretty quickly, especially because flying, even though it's faster technically, but then you end up um, in the airport and stuck if your flight is delayed. So overall, it, it does take a lot more time. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the travel things are pretty fascinating. I mean, like, cruise ships being stopped right now seems like a, a nice thing. Um, evictions being stopped right now seems like a pretty great thing. <clears throat> um, yeah. I guess uh, in terms of things that stop, like um, I just find it really lovely, the overwhelming support that people have been giving to others as the, like a lot of these resources have stopped, like seeing artists too, seeing artists or like support other people. Like I, I just saw Guadalupe Maravilla who we had as a speaker earlier this year, kind of like talking, um, talking about channeling money to um, um, undocumented people um, in the U US and trying to figure out methodologies to do that. And I feel like it's really interesting to see some roles that artists have once occupied all of a sudden shift and art institutions too. Mm -hmm. I just don't like, I, I guess like I'm kind of wondering like what the, what, how that affects what happens in the long term in terms of like what we frame as a function of these roles. Mm -hmm. yeah when you brought up art institutions it also made me think of the ways they're not supporting uh, <laughs> like say like MoMA uh, yeah. who laid off you know 80% of its um, educational department staff or canceled yeah. the contracts um, yeah. like I'm like way way more concerned about that than I am what MoMA's putting up on their online galleries. Um, like there's just, I feel like a disconnect sometimes with some of these institutions on yeah. like the things that they should be prioritizing. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I was thinking like maybe there should be a campaign to unfollow MoMA um, because we don't care about what you're putting online. Like we just want you to support your people. But then I'm like, oh, but then all of those PR people are going to get laid off. Right. It seems like there's a sac. Yeah, it's like it goes back to that idea. It's like, what do you sacrifice? Like in terms of your privileges, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. I think like in yeah, what things have stopped that we don't want to see continue. Like it's been really great seeing like how the pollution has decreased from like no one driving, but then to like that's a lot of people don't they have to drive to get to their job. And so to like think that that should cease is kind of, yeah, like a complicated situation. So like it's great the pollution is going away, but then yeah, like a lot of it's still, like a lot of these things are still like just totally entrenched in the way our society's gonna fun- functions and it's gonna go back to functioning. Yeah. I guess it's like, it, it makes me imagine like a future where, um, I mean, we're talking about um, like, I, I don't, I, I'm forgetting the proper term, but it's like, or I guess it's like essential and non-essential labor. Mm. Um, and it, it begs the question of like, in the future, are we imagining also a world where there's less commuting? And so like, there are, like, we really get to examine like the necessity of on-site labor versus remote labor and like reframing those things. Mm-hmm. Um, but then that like doesn't really get us deep enough into like considering like how to make labor more equitable, right? Like, I mean, there are already remote workers that exist out there. Um, so I guess it's just kind of like following on a traditional model that already exists, but maybe like um, it, it manifests to a greater degree. Mm-hmm. a lot to think about <laughs> yeah yeah i i think it it is kind of rushing forward a lot of conversations that were happening in terms of um yeah like what labor needs to occur how that can be replaced like people's incomes like a lot of those um things like the um the ubi was not like i mean it was in the conversation but it was definitely a little more like fringe of things people were like uh, coming more mainstream but now it's like uh, right there is it's like oh that really is like the, you know this happened now but it could happen again in a year no problem or this could just blow back up i mean it's still blowing up but it could we could reopen and then have to close again right so it's um yeah pushing a lot of those conversations to the forefront pretty quickly i think well, and it's, I mean, thinking about, you know, on a political level too, that you know, there was that president, the guy that was running for president that was talking about how, you know, every American should have like a $2,000, like li- minimum living wage a month or something like that. And oh, it's, that's impossible. It's impossible. But it's amazing how fast they were able to pre- procure like 1200 bucks for each individual, um, you know, in ways of like thinking about people's like basic living like how how is that going to happen and even with like the cares act i know a lot of people who are getting more now because of unemployment than they were making when they were working 40 hours a week so what does that say about our society so just thinking about ways that you know something good maybe can come out of something of like a crummy situation that betters the individual's lives yeah it makes me think about like the function of um emergency um, and how during a time of emergency, what ends up happening is there's not enough bandwidth to think through these things. And as opposed to like strategizing, I mean, not everybody, I think that there's like definitely heads of government that are scheming to take advantage of the current moment. <laughs> but I, I think definitely like during this moment, like things like universal basic income or like a $1,200 check occurs as a result of like not necessarily having enough time to like really think through how to implement uh, a strategic kind of support. 
Um, and strategy meaning that it's like, there's like hierarchies that are embedded within that particular strategy. Um, it's really interesting how um, socialism rises up as a result of an emergency. And um, it makes me think of like how critical it is to think about it. <laughs> and like, um, how do we define what an emergency is and what isn't? Yeah, I yeah. Can... Oh, go ahead, please. <laughs> I was going to say that for me connects also to healthcare. Also, how a lot of people lost their um, health insurance because they lost their jobs. And so, you know, the conversation around health insurance is not a new one, you know, or healthcare in general. It's all, it's been there for a while. And then, but then there are these models in other countries that exist that are better. They might not be perfect. And so then, you know, why? are those models sort of like working there and established there and not here and you know and then when, when this pandemic happens you see a lot of issues highlighted because of you know that structure that's really not benefiting a lot of people mm -hmm. yeah there have been some good graphs of like how many people have lost their health insurance because of covid19 and like just the U.S. really it's, is the, the one of the few countries where it's actually happened. Um, I guess I'm kind of curious, um, Mac, how you're thinking about these things, because it seems like you've been thinking about it a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think I'm in like part of a few groups, which has been really great. Like um, actually somebody from my, my MA cohort in Berlin sent me this Latour text and was like, hey, there's a group of us getting together to talk about this. Um, and so it was really, and again, that was amazing because there were people from all over, um, people in South Africa and people in Brazil and uh, different parts of Europe. Uh, sort of like in each session, they're gonna look at one question. So, so far we've done the first one. Um, I, you know, like I, for me, I feel like it's the kind of wait and see is starting to get a little, like I feel the pressure from like the wait and see. Um, like, and I am really imagining ways in which like this is gonna start to look. Um, I mean, I think at, I mean, at PNCA, like we're talking about uh, structures of student body A and student body B and student body A gets access to campus Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and B Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday um, to try to limit how many people are around. Um, you know, I was imagining going to a basketball game and there being like two seats between me and the next person. Um, <clears throat> uh, just like really trying to start imagining like how like in a real functional way, some of this might flow. But yeah. then I think with the text, with the Latour text, there are these opportunities to like start having these sort of fantasies in a way, right? Like, like what we would do for workers to try to create systems where people didn't have to have cars. Um, like, like what are ways uh, to start making uh, carpooling uh, something that has to, has to happen and that it's, you know, there's a, an, ad, an app developed to help pair people up to create those types of scenarios. Like those types of things are, and then even like, would that even work? Cause now am I being too close to that person? <laughs> start, those things start catching up, but it's been amazing to hear about other countries and the way they've dealt with it. Um, in Norway, for example, my friends who are living there were like, Oh yeah, the Norwegian government recommended that we pick two other families to social distance with, basically, so that our kids could still have people to play with and socialize, and that you just create these sort of like you know almost infinity groups, I guess, um, these little pod networks of people, um, and like that's like like oh right, like we should have been doing that, <laughs> like like that was a that was like here's a here's a country who's not thinking about just has us as individuals, but us as communities and us as families and what a different approach. Um, 
you know, I think what Sweden did was pretty weird, but they're talking about having hive immunity in Oz in um, Stockholm in the next couple of weeks. Right. But that's also like, they've had like almost three times the amount of death as the countries around them. Um, so like they just sacrificing the old um, and the not well to kind of reopen as quickly as possible. Um, or are they just like, I don't know, this is like a, a way to do this. And I think it's really interesting to have somebody trying something too. Yeah. yeah. No, a lot to think about. <laughs> um, yeah, and I mean, I guess with that, it seems like what's helped you out at the moment is really thinking about different ways to really be, be able to focus on community. And I guess for people that are thinking about if maybe they haven't done that before or aren't doing the, it during the pandemic, like, do you have any kind of advice in terms of like getting involved given that everyone's kind of isolated? Um, because I imagine that, it, you know, it's like a clunky start. <laughs> Not everyone has the mechanism to do it. Yeah. Um, I definitely wasn't as like quick on some of the things that like my partner Ariana, who some of my, a lot of you know, uh, was able to do like getting, getting together with people online, reaching out to people. Um, I was definitely a bit slower. So I, I feel that like um, the kind of devastation of it was pretty hard. I mean, I guess in part because most of my being is about making things for the public to come experience. Um, and so all of a sudden, like I had no being, um, which was a little brutal feeling. And so like, I was definitely slow, but like, I feel like the, the community I first started to try to get to was a community of people that I like send postcards to, which is such a weird group because it's not like, it's that there's not like a like there is a connection there that happens but there's not like it's, it's not so satisfying and i'm actually not very interested in like people like sharing it in like a social media because i feel like a lot of those things are a little more personal um so there was this sort of like there's sort of like a uh conundrum there in some ways but i do think that the 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 moment is so ripe to reach out to people. Um, I mean, I'm somebody who always feels comfortable like responding to an email a year after somebody sent it and being like, hey, I'm really sorry, I'm just getting to this, but hey, I really would love to talk. Or like, I haven't talked to this person in three years, I'm just gonna text them. Like, I've always been like that. And it took me a while to like realize that and like, oh, this is a great moment for that. Um, Maybe it's part of my astrological sign. I don't know, but um, that I feel like that is the like. This is the greatest excuse to like reach out to somebody you've been wanting to talk to for a while but haven't. <clears throat> um, well, I suppose that maybe we can close off, right? Un unless you all have any other questions. I had a quick question. Um, what are you reading right now? Yeah, what am I reading? Um, you know, I'm not, I've been reading this book called um, Future Publix, which has been pretty great. It's um, in part, I started reading it because Brian Holmes, uh, who's a cultural critic and friend had an essay in it that I remember really loving because it's about, um, this idea of the call to art um, and sort of like a, the development of a new, new audience for art um, that either like, like art, art institutions are either gonna become kind of just like tools for um, kind of like design laboratories or like playgrounds for the ultra wealthy um, and the, the, this book was really written in, in the, during the financial coming just out of the financial crisis 
in the late aughts. Um, and so like that book has been really interesting to read because it's like of another crisis moment. Um, and now I'm just like looking over to my side to see what else I have kicking over here. Um, beyond that, I've been uh, reading a lot online of news. I just like, and I, all, I, I always have been somebody who read a lot of news, but now I've taken it to like another level in some ways, which has been uh, a little obnoxious. Um, and I really, what I really want to do is read a little more fiction, which is something I haven't done. Um, but I do have a book here that's uh, called Lifelines by Heidi Deal that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start reading, which uh, actually it takes place, part of it takes place in like Eugene area, and then part of it takes place in Cologne. And it's about an artist, uh, a, a woman who uh, studied abroad in Germany uh, in like the 70s and, or late 80s or, or early 80s rather. And, uh, but she's from Eugene and like teaches art at U of O, I believe. Um, and it's sort of like, she has to go back there for somebody's funeral and she's like dealing with all this stuff with, one, with her daughter. Um, and it just seems really great. And it's my good friend, Carl Deal's sister uh, wrote it. And I've been meaning to read it and I have this signed copy and I haven't read it. And I'm like, oh, I'm in quarantine. This is probably the time to read this book. Um, is anybody else reading anything that uh, seems relevant or particularly awesome? or watching something even. <laughs> I feel like at the time for recommendations. <laughs> um, I've been reading something. I'm forgetting the name of, I keep on forgetting the title. I talked to Darby about this yesterday too, but um, I, I think it's along the line, the title's along the lines of thinking through times of emergency. Mm. Um, and that's kind of just been on my mind thinking about, um, ways in which people uh, process things and operate under a panic. I'll, I'll uh, send you a link later. I think I've been, oh, go ahead, Alex. Sorry. Oh, no, you, no, you can go, you can go. <laughs> um, I think I've been turning to kind of like the comfort food, you know, style of like, I've gotten really back into reading poetry again, which is uh, really fun. And then just like watching the TV shows that just like always like take me to a fun mm. place like 30 Rock or something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, uh, I just started uh, rereading the uh, Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein, which uh, felt kind of like applicable to reread since it's all about that kind of um, like privatization in like the wake of disasters. And I, mm -hmm. I think that uh, particularly what was going on with the post office uh, right now uh, and the possibility of that getting taken over uh, felt uh, applicable yet to, to reread. Um, and then, yeah, otherwise I've just been kind of, I've been digging through my like random books that I bought here and there just to like, just to read something. I've been kind of like, yeah, just like whatever's good. It's like, I read a like not very good Stephen King book because I like bought it at Goodwill, like I don't know when, and I found it in my basement and was like, all right, like this is what it is. <laughs> and it's just like something. Mm -hmm. um, I finally started getting into a book that I've been trying to read, I think for the last year, but haven't had the space for, which is The Queer Art of Failure. Mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been good so far. I, I'm just like a couple chapters in, so. Lots of like really good reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, Raja, shall we end? Like, I mean, I guess. Is this yeah, this sounds good. Oh, I guess I had one one last question. Okay. Um, earlier you uh, had mentioned um, artists that you were interested in how they were responding or like people you like to watch. Do you uh, have anyone you kind of recommend for people to check out of what, what they're doing right now? Yeah, I mean, I think mostly it's been people either like like social media feeds who have been particularly funny or biting, like Stephanie Sahuko. Um, 
or people I've like messaged with uh, a little bit, like Steve Kurtz from Critical Art Ensemble. Um, you know, Steve actually for the last few years have really been digging into a lot of uh, the, the idea of necropolitics. Um, and I feel like it's like such an interesting moment to think about necropolitics. Um, this idea that, uh, you know, like uh, what, what politics and policies are really about is deciding who lives and who dies when you like boil it down and then like going deeper into that and then the sort of implications of that on culture. Um, and then I feel like I'm like, there's been some artists like Colleen Smith who has been really publishing a lot of her old film works onto Instagram. And those have been amazing to be able to engage with um, because she doesn't often share those. Um, and if you find those interesting, actually she gave a talk at PNCA, I think that's on our Vimeo or on our YouTube. And her talk was really great. It was really like how uh, independent filmmaking and social practice are forms of uh, colonization and colonial mm -hmm. mindsets. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a really great talk. Um, Interesting. But yeah, I'm actually really curious to see like, you know, I like actually I spent the day yesterday with grad students in PNCA's visual studies program. And it was amazing to see what kinds of things are bubbling up through that as well. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mac. Yeah, thanks uh, so thank much you. for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Feel free to reach out if um, there was anything I didn't answer or that you didn't get to ask for this format. Happy to chat on the phone even. Cool. Um, OK. Um, I suppose we should sign off, yeah? All right. Well. Have a great day, everybody. Good luck. Thank you. You too. See we'll you soon, I hope. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully soon. <laughs> Bye.